For over 50 years, Formula One has been two contests. One between the drivers on the track and the other between the Formula One rule makers and the engineers who design and build the cars. Because of this, Formula One is the most technologically advanced sport in the world. Its engineering is more aeroplane than automobile. The rules are the formula. They define everything. Size of tires, chassis dimensions, type of engine, even track safety. Formula One, like a game of chess, played at 300 kilometers an hour. This Formula One car was built by Williams Grand Prix Engineering in 1993. It's called an FW15. Alain Prost won the World Drivers' Championship in it. Underneath its carbon fiber skin is a treasure trove of computer-controlled hydraulic hardware. The FW15 had traction control, electronic engine management, a computer-controlled semi-automatic gearbox, and active suspension. Without electronics, the car would have been impossible to drive. It remains the most technologically advanced racing car ever built. We were adding such a high degree of complexity to the car with all of the suspension electronically controlled, um, but in immense power that the engineer could then have to literally fly this low-flying aircraft uh, at any attitude he wanted, make it roll compensate, roll into the corners instead of rolling out all sorts of uh, powers we had. The car was so advanced technically, in many ways it's the most advanced racing car that's ever been built technically because a lot of the things that it had were banned subsequently. The FW15 was banned at the end of the 1993 season. Formula One's rule makers, the FIA, were concerned about three aspects of this generation of Formula One cars. Track speed had become dangerously high. The software within the cars was impossible to police and the electronics created a perception that Formula One cars were removing driver skill. Part of what Formula One is about is understanding how good drivers are and demonstrating driver skill, and those things really took some of that away, so they should go. And they really were saying Formula One is uh, a different thing to road cars. But road cars are increasingly important to Formula One. The big car manufacturers are moving in, in the hope that the technical glamour of racing will rub off on their products. Williams driver Juan Pablo Montoya and test driver Marc Genet are at Valencia's racing circuit to thrill the guests of one of Williams' biggest sponsors. They'll do this in a road car stuffed with electronic driver aids to make it easier to control but they'll turn off the most vital driver aid, stability or traction control. With the traction control turned off, the handling of the cars is now down to driver skill. They can perform maneuvers impossible with the electronics fully engaged. When Montoya steals back the drive from the computer like this, he is taking a technological step backwards. Another racetrack, Silverstone, England. This is what Montoya calls his office. A Formula One car is a different species from a road car. It has no doors, and to save weight, it doesn't even have a built-in starter motor. <laughs> 
When the engine starts, it idles at the same speed as the rest of us drive at. In comparison with the road car that Montoya drove at Valencia, it has few electronic aids. The aids that are allowed on Formula One cars have been banned, reinstated, modified, curtailed, and sometimes simply hidden from the scrutineers. Clever engineers are always trying to outwit the men who write the rules or formula. The big problem that late 20th century Formula One racing got itself into was that the cars were getting more and more clever. And the danger was that the driver was going to play a smaller and smaller part in winning the race. And that's not good box office. If the drivers are the box office heroes, they are increasingly in the hands of the team's engineers. Engineers can now control not just what he drives, but how he drives it. Spectators who switch on to watch the drivers battle on the track are at the very heart of Formula One. Without spectators, sponsors would not bother to buy the space on the cars. Without the money from the sponsors, the teams cannot fund the technology that threatens to alienate the spectators. But without the technology, it isn't Formula One. This unique contradiction is in constant danger of destroying the sport. The problem first arose in 1977, when an apparently invisible secret advantage made two cars unbeatable. Since the late 70s, Formula One cars have looked less like cars and more like aircraft. Instead of the cigar-shaped, streamlined racers of previous eras, these cars of the new era evolved into extraordinary pieces of secret technology. The first were the sinister black Lotus 78 cars, designed by Colin Chapman. They hid a secret that few at the time understood. The Williams FW24 is a direct descendant of the Lotus 78. Its layout is universally accepted as the perfect solution for a single-seat racer. The ten-cylinder engine is low down in the middle. Either side of the cockpit are cooling ducts. Behind these are radiators for the engine. There are no fans to move the air when the car is stationary. The semi-automatic gearbox is bolted onto the back of the engine. It supports all the suspension and final drive to the rear wheels. Tucked between the engine and the driver is a self-sealing bag holding about 100 litres of fuel. The car's bodywork is entirely aerodynamic, moulded from carbon fibre composites. A rear-wheel drive road car's layout has not changed since the 1930s. The body is a steel shell called a monocoque. The engine is mounted between the wheels at the front. Ahead of the engine is the radiator. Fans keep it cool when the car is stationary. Bolted behind the engine is a gearbox. A propeller shaft from the gearbox takes the power through a differential to the drive shafts for the rear wheels. A steel or plastic fuel tank is fitted under the rear seats. The driver sits upright and to one side. And to make driving easier, any amount of technology can be added to the basic package. At one time, road cars benefited from racing. Tires, brakes, steering, engines, all were refined on the track. With the arrival of computers, an invisible revolution has overtaken the building and driving of cars. Super saloons like this have traction control, stability control, anti-lock brakes, active suspension, electronic gear selection, and even a memory of who is driving it. But most of this did not come from Formula One. Nobody in Formula One has said 
with a straight face for some years that motorsport improves the breed of road cars. Most of what is on a Formula One car is of no interest for road cars, but is of great interest to engineers. Frank Derny is an engineer, an aerodynamicist. By blowing over the top surface of a sheet of paper, he is demonstrating a scientific fact. When air speeds up over a surface, its pressure drops. The paper is sucked up into the air. An aeroplane wing uses this principle to get lift and to fly. This was the secret that engineers at Lotus had stumbled on. Hidden under the black bodywork of the car was a primitive upside-down wing shape. Rubber skirts running close to the road were the only clue to the physics going on behind them. As the car raced forward, stationary air was forced under the car and accelerated by the wing shape. As the air speeded up, the pressure dropped, sticking the car to the road. The skirts were an attempt to seal the low pressure from the outside air. Lotus produced a car which is just beating all of us. And obviously it had got some particular technical feature that really was a big step forward, and we didn't really know what it was. And, so, and Lotus were very good at putting out smoke screens. The big one was they'd invented a fantastic new differential. And every time the car was worked on, they would put a cover over the gearbox, and somebody would go scuttling into the truck with a, a piece of cloth covering some device. And so everyone's eye was taken off the ball, because what they'd actually done was discovered a way of getting about three times more downforce without any more drag which gave them the grip, and frankly, the differential couldn't, even if it was perfect, have made as much difference as we were being hoodwinked into trying to believe. In the end, it became perfectly clear by making a wind tunnel model that ground effect was just a huge step forward. Frank Derny helped perfect what Lotus had discovered. The 1979 FW07 had a better wing shape, but Derny also realized that the air constantly leaking into the underside and destroying the suction could be cured by having a sliding skirt. The skirt on the Williams wasn't flexible. It was stiff and moved up and down in a slot in the side pod, sealing the car to the road at all times. The performance advantage was a revelation. Skirts were banned in 1981. From then on, any aerodynamic advantages had to be hunted down on every square centimetre on the car's surface. Well, the first thing that hits the air is the front wing, and the front wing is simply an upside-down aeroplane wing. These big end plates on here, to, to reduce the fact that the low pressure underneath the car will, uh, will be sucking air in, and the less air you suck in, the more downforce you retain. These bits here, for picking up air to cool the brakes. If you don't keep the brakes cool, the car reliability is destroyed, and it's very important, but unfortunately, it's very easy for the flow around these to flow inwards and disturb the side pod flow or the rear wing flow. And that it's surprising how important the brake duct shape is. The engine has to be fed with air. This is a turbocharged car, so it's got cooling air and air to keep the uh, compressed turbocharged air cool. And there's a minimum amount of air that needs to go through there. Every extra bit of air that you let go through there produces extra drag and takes momentum out of the airstream, which means that it isn't there to produce extra downforce. So as an aerodynamicist, you run the engine as hot as the engine manufacturers will let you, because that'll give you the best aerodynamic performance. Round here, you have the problem of letting all the hot air out from the engine, from the radiators, and still maintaining good downforce from the wing. And so everything ahead of this rear is all orientated about not upsetting the flow here. So the outline of a Formula One car is scientific, not cosmetic. Even without skirts and a regulation flat bottom instead of a wing shape, Aerodynamicists can still get some downforce from under the car.
The front wings, hitting clean air, are adjusted to force the front of the car down. This aids grip, particularly when cornering. The body of the car is contoured to keep air attached to it. The better this is done, the better the rear wings will work. Downforce over the rear wheels helps give all important grip. In a good car, all these elements work in perfect harmony. In a bad car, they don't. The problem with getting downforce from wings on top of the car is drag. Drag is turbulent air sucked along behind the car. Air has weight, and because the drag is reluctant to let go, it can be like towing a caravan at 250 kilometers an hour. If the downforce is generated from the wing at the back of the car, then with it, it brings extra drag, and then depending on the speed of the car, that uh, requires additional horsepower to overcome that extra drag. So if you have a horsepower advantage, you can use some of it to run a bit more aerodynamic downforce on the car and inevitably a bit more drag while still maintaining just enough to make sure that you're a few kilometers an hour quicker than your opposition. So having a more powerful engine is definitely an advantage. During the 1980s, Formula One cars had engines half the size of today's cars, but they were turbocharged. Turbos produced huge amounts of power Wings or no wings, they were much too fast. They were banned. Turbos had used complex electronic engine management computers to keep the engines from exploding. With the turbos gone, engineers would find other things to do with the computers. The focus could now move back to the secret underside of the car. By 1992, Formula One engineers had realized that computers could revolutionize the car's handling. Better still, there were no rules governing their use. Digital electronic computers can process enormous amounts of information at very high speeds. They are perfect for stabilizing unstable machines. The Eurofighter is an unstable machine, a plane designed in the Cold War era for combat. It is built around three supercomputers. The pilot flies the computers, and the computers fly the plane. The computers were not there. The pilot could not fly this airplane. There is no manual backup. So if you like, we are reliant upon the computers, but happy to be so because of the benefits they give us. The benefits are that the pilot doesn't have to worry about making turns or loops that would crash the plane or tear it apart. The computer constantly assesses what the pilot has done, processes information about the attitude of the plane, and keeps things stable while he does the fighting. The FW-15 did a similar thing. It didn't have springs and dampers. Instead, Hydraulic actuators controlled by an onboard computer absorbed the bumps and rolls of the fast-moving car. The computer processed information about what the driver was doing and the car's attitude to the road thousands of times a second. This was fed to the actuators that held the car exactly six centimeters above the track at all times. The whole idea was to keep the car as its optimum height above the ground so that it was always producing the maximum amount of downforce. With conventional springs, as soon as you hit the brakes, there's weight transfer forward and the front goes down and the back goes up, which changes the balance of the car. And as soon as you pick up the throttle in the middle of the corner, the back goes down and the front comes up, which changes the balance of the car. And if you could have an active suspension system, which was fast enough acting to compensate for that, and also, even more important, held the car, regardless of whether it was a low-speed corner with not much downforce or a high-speed corner with just a huge amount of downforce, you still have the car optimum height above the ground. That was the objective of the active suspension, and it is worth seconds a lap, not tenths, seconds. Active suspension was banned for the 1994 season. To the engineers, this seemed unfair. 
Previous bans had been imposed on the grounds of safety. Active suspension, clearly one technical idea that could apply to road cars, was banned because it was a driver aid. I don't think that the active suspension itself um, was a driver aid. It didn't actually drive the car for the driver. It raised the performance potential of the car, but it was a very, very interesting technology which I think could have many commercial uses as well. And I think it was rather a pity that Formula One uh, jumped on that one to uh, limit it. They saw it as restricting the role of the driver and turning the driver into a kind of robot, if you like. I mean, that's an extreme image. So there is an argument of a sort of driver versus technological aids or drivers versus the cutting edge of technology. That's not a simple question because which, which direction do you move in? And the sport is kind of trying to work out where to go between the two. Engineers are so good at making up for lost ground regardless of what limitation is placed on them, that the car would then exceed the speed that the circuit was built for. And that is a given mathematical fact. It would happen. There are corners all around the world that would become unusable if the cars were not controlled in the way they use their wings and the aerodynamics and the power of the engine and the traction and everything else. Even with no skirts, no turbos and no active suspension, a modern Formula One car can generate enough speed and downforce to easily overcome its own weight. It could race on the roof of a tunnel with ease. The restrictiveness of the rules does force one to be ever more creative. And it does drive you to think of everything single way you can think of to create, to find a legal loophole in the regulation which you can exploit and make your car quicker. And if it's permitted, everyone else will charge with the same gap as well. So you have to think of somebody else, of something else. And that's part of the fun. The minute a racing car hits the road, the designer of that car, the man whose signature's at the bottom, will be thinking like an artist, I want to get on with the next painting or the next car because I know this isn't right or that isn't right, and if we can get the engine supplier to do this, then I know I can do that. So it's just constant change all the time. And if a car that can defeat gravity is the result, it isn't surprising. The source for most of the technology is aircraft. Think of aerospace. Aerospace is about aerodynamics. It's also about being very creative about materials, making it as light as possible, making it as strong as possible, making it operate in extreme conditions. That's nothing to do with road car manufacture, really. Likewise, motor racing is exactly like that. You know, how can you make that car as light as possible? As light as possible. And how can you make that suspension at the same time as strong as possible? Hence the whole use of carbon fiber and so on. So those kind of skills around materials, uh, around aerodynamics, is an example of how the industries interact. There are some requirements for a Formula One car that are common with, say, a high-performance fighter aircraft. You, you want very lightweight, high level of structural integrity within a small volume, a very high engine power and systems packed within this very small space, a very high aerodynamic performance, very high aerodynamic efficiency. All these things tend to lead to the design thinking having certain common aspects between the two and in truth some of the materials employed uh, whether they were say aluminium alloys or titaniums and some of the you know bonding and uh, joining techniques and more recently within the last 20 years composites uh, a lot to increase structural integrity reduce weight this is nothing new Racing car design has always stolen ideas from aircraft. And sometimes aircraft have secretly stolen from cars. skirted cars of the late 70s 
to the active suspension cars of the early 90s, Formula One engineers have become increasingly secretive about their technology. By the time this car was banned in 1993, Formula One drivers had a skilled secret assistant on board, a powerful computer. Everything from the spark that ignited the fuel in the engine to the split-second decision to change gear was controlled by an electronic brain. The parallels to aircraft design were obvious, not just in the winged profile of the modern Formula One car, but in the electronic revolution taking place in the cockpit. Something had to be done. It was decided that all those driver aids should come off because it should, the emphasis should be on the driver's championship. So all the driver aids came off. There was one alternative, and that was to uh, say that the FIA would issue standard electronic control units, which would be given out for every engine. But eventually, they decided that the car companies would be frightened away because it would effectively cut across their technology. And for the first time since the 1930s, the car companies were coming back to Formula One, precisely because of its high-tech profile. And the powerful auto giants know the lessons of history. Technology will always win. Aircraft and reliable cars were born at the beginning of the 20th century. By the time planes looked like this in the 1930s, the same engineers were often working on both. Men like Richard Shuttleworth saw planes and racing cars as opportunities to develop and share technology. In 1935, he raced a supercharged Alfa Romeo through the murk of an English summer at Castle Donington. He won the race. Shuttleworth's legacy is a world-famous collection of aircraft. These planes, perhaps the Eurofighters of their day, look quaint now, but at the time offered inspiration for racing car designers. In the aircraft industry, because um, strength plus flexibility, um, there's a very high premium on those qualities. Then again, there was a powerful synergy with motor racing because you wanted to make the car as light as possible and as strong as possible. The synergy was everywhere. Whenever old racing cars are dusted off and gathered together, the ghosts of aeroplanes come too. Car cockpits bear a striking resemblance to cockpits of aircraft. Large ducted radiators, cooled high-performance engines, big bore exhaust look at home on a Hawker Nimrod and a Maserati. Spoked wheels offered lightness and strength on both. Streamlining smoothed air round undercarriages and was famously applied to cars. Even details like wire locking nuts to prevent loosening through vibration was common. For on-the-spot maintenance and repair, quick-release fastenings held on riveted aluminium skins. Wing struts on this 1931 Avro Tutor biplane are aerodynamically profiled like the suspension struts on a Williams racing car, built 60 years later. Most important of all, aviation was an object lesson to motor racing. 
in showing how to pack large high-performance engines into confined spaces. Aircraft designers search out anything that can do a job better. In 1934, Wood offered a small weight advantage, and a Havilland aircraft took it. But it was the shape that pointed to the future. Three de Havilland Comets were built for the England to Australia air race. This is the plane that won the race, Grosvenor House. The narrow fuselage contained three huge fuel tanks. Behind these sat the pilot and co-pilot, one behind the other. It had two small, highly tuned six-cylinder engines. This combination of small engines, streamlined fuselage, and clever details like retractable wheels meant it could cruise close to its top speed of 380 kilometers an hour. The theme would reappear five years later as World War II's fastest bomber, the Mosquito. For the Germans, the development of aircraft engines had been forbidden since 1919. In a reverse of the normal situation, where aircraft technology finds its way into racing cars, the German racing cars helped to keep engine technology up to date. In 1937, Messerschmitts were fitted with Daimler-Benz 12-cylinder supercharged engines. A little later, direct fuel injection was added. The parallels with racing car engines were obvious. Less than a decade after the end of the war, Mercedes-Benz was back in racing. Their W196 was almost unbeatable. Direct fuel injection on an eight-cylinder engine had clear aircraft origins. Ten years earlier, there was another make of car racing for Nazi Germany. The auto union was very different. Its designer, Ferdinand Porsche, was convinced that moving the engine behind the driver was a better layout for a racing car. Auto unions first appeared in 1934. They were unique. The fuel tank sat between the driver and the supercharged 16-cylinder engine. A tubular frame also carried coolants from the radiator at the front to the engine at the rear. The Spartan cockpit owed everything to aircraft design of the time. By 1937, Grand Prix racing, dominated by the German factory teams, was heading towards speeds of 320 kilometers an hour. New rules limiting the cars to a maximum weight of 750 kilograms were imposed to stop this. It was supposed to limit the size and power of engines. But the development of high-strength, lightweight alloys, better streamlining, and smaller components meant the restrictions had little effect. Mercedes-Benz benefited most. Porsche's cars had built-in problems. The revolutionary suspension and tall, heavy engines made his cars fearsomely difficult to handle. The futuristic engine-behind-the-driver idea would be neglected for almost 20 years. In 1951, up-and-coming young drivers mingle with more experienced old hands and autograph hunters. All day, teams arrive at an old airfield called Silverstone for the British Grand Prix. The cars now conform to regulations 
known as Formula One. All of the competing cars now have engines conventionally mounted at the front. It was rather shambolic um, sport for primarily for wealthy amateurs. Uh, and they were enjoying themselves and there was no discipline, there was comparatively little organization. Uh, the lack of safety when you look back was absolutely frightening. The engine was in front of the car, the driver wore a t-shirt and a linen helmet and cotton trousers, he had no safety belts. Um, there were no gravel traps, there was no arm co. And there were over 100,000 people at Silverstone for the first Grand Prix after the war and just a piece of rope between them and the cars, and it's a miracle that there weren't mass fatalities. The spectators behind the ropes were unlikely to see a yellow car win a Grand Prix. In the races of the early 1950s, red cars, the traditional racing colour of Italy, had the best engines and won the most races. The dominance of Italy and Ferrari and Maserati in the 1950s was associated with the engine and the position of the engine at the front of the car. And that's how Formula One was in the 1950s. Except for one guy. There was one guy, John Cooper, who put his engine at the back. And that wasn't in Formula One, that was in Formula Three, which were these funny little cars, engine at the back, motorbike engine. And no one would have guessed then that that was the future. The future of post-war Formula One started in 1947 in the back of a garage in the London suburb of Surbiton. Engineer John Cooper, seen here in the middle, designed and built cars for the aptly named poor man's racing formula, Formula Three. His recipe for a racing car involved welding the front ends of two scrap Fiat 500s together, then adding some tubes. Cooper put the engine behind the driver for the simple reason that in Formula 3, power was transmitted from motorcycle engines by chain. And the shorter the chain to the rear wheels, the better. With the weight of the engine and the driver equally distributed between the wheels, his cars were inherently well balanced. John Cooper's cars did a roaring trade among amateur drivers, wanting something cheap and reliable at the weekends. He was an engineer, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew the benefits of putting the engine where he did. I'm sure he'd seen the Auto Union and the very few other rear engine racing cars that there had been before the war, uh, and thought that he could do it better. Monaco, for the first Grand Prix of the season in Europe. The big names of motor racing line up to take their measure for the season. Now second. By 1958, Cooper was doing better. His ideas developed into Formula Two cars and then Formula One. Despite having less horsepower than the competition, the Coopers had better balance and could corner faster and were beginning to worry the Italians. The duel for supremacy is fought out in grim earnest. Little by little, Cooper had finished the job that Porsche had started with his pre-war, rear-engined auto unions. He couldn't catch Jack Brabham showing the form for the season by winning in the Cooper climate. Within a handful of years, uh, Cooper had got into Formula One with a, you know, half an engine, really, in terms of power. But the formula was so much superior to the front engine. So Colin Chapman, the most creative engineer, probably, of Formula One in the second half of the 20th century, copied him for the Lotus. Jim Clark would win his first world championship in Chapman's revolutionary Lotus 25 in 1963. Chapman was a pilot. As well as inspiration from Cooper, he borrowed liberally from aviation.
The 25 chassis had a monocoque construction. The driver was now almost lying down in the car, lowering its center of gravity and improving the aerodynamic airflow. Weight was saved by using the engine and gearbox as mounting points for the rear suspension. The Lotus 25 cemented Britain's growing dominance of Formula One. By the late 50s, early 60s, Ferrari had copied. You couldn't go into Formula One unless you had an engine at the back because it completely transformed the weight, the handling characteristics, the aerodynamics, everything. It was a new type of car. The next new car, or rather its engine, arrived in 1967. Chapman and engine designer Keith Duckworth made the engine part of the car's load-bearing structure by bolting it directly to the back of the monocoque. Let's see if it all goes together now. Come on. Oh, all right. me. Steady. Steady. Down a bit. Uh, Take it down. Doug, yeah. Yeah, that's fitting well. Beautiful. Yep, that's the job. Lovely. The engine was the main structure of the, of the car, and that was classic aircraft structure, and the whole uh, style that was carried over onto the Lotus 49 was straight from the aircraft industry. By 1967, all the teams had the engine Cooper style behind the driver. The Italian Ferraris and the early Honda-powered cars had seen the future. But Chapman's new innovation of using the engine as a stressed part of the car's construction was unbeatable. The championship was his. The emphasis was now moving away from the track a game of technological cat and mouse developed as Formula One rulemakers tried to catch the engineers. Cars with six wheels, this is the Ford-powered Tyrrell, tried to reduce the drag from big tires. Bernie Eccleston's Brabham, plagued with an underpowered Alfa Romeo engine, found a winning way by using a fan to stick the car onto the road in corners a sort of hovercraft in reverse. It had one outing, won the race, and was banned. Fascinating as it was, this battle behind the closed doors of the team's increasingly secret factories could only lead to one thing. It's very obvious now that cars could be built that wouldn't need a driver at all. You can, you can program the cars to do everything. And anything you can't program into the car, you can do from the pits with you know, dials and buttons and hand controllers. But nobody would go to watch that. Since the earliest days of the 20th century, aircraft shared their technology with racing cars. Slowly, then with increasing speed, cars for the track have become less like road cars and more like aircraft. And certainly what I'm looking at is, is probably more close to an aircraft fuselage than it is anything that somebody would drive along the street in. I've always thought that if this was 1942, Patrick Head would be the sort of guy at the forefront of the development of the Spitfire and the Hurricane. I imagine they were the sorts of engineers who were pushing those extremes at that moment. Today's Spitfire is a technological free-for-all. 
It is packed with electronic systems. Systems which are already revolutionizing road cars. There's absolutely no reason why Formula One shouldn't be a technological free-for-all. It's just my concern that it doesn't seem to be quite clear in its own mind what it should be. I mean, you can't uninvent things that have already been invented. So you've got to embrace technology. The question is, how far do you take it? It is not untrue to say that nowadays they could, they could put things on cars and program them to go around the circuits by themselves. They, they wouldn't need a driver at all. But that's not what motor racing is about. It's a combination of man and machine. In planes, man and machine are locked together by electronics. The future of aircraft control is not muscle power or skill. It is a conversation. Display engines, hide, stores, das, head down, stores, freaks. In the modern battle space, there's so much information out there, and the sensors on board the airplane can pick all that up. It would be very, very easy uh, for that information to overload the pilot, unless you filter it by way of computers and give him a picture in the cockpit that he can deal with. He's, he's useless in that fighting platform. Top drivers have always been able to cope with information overload. Formula One engineers are already removing it. Since the start of 2002, electronic traction control, or TC, has been legal on Formula One cars. Traction control turned off means this is possible. Switched on, TC doesn't make cars faster. It just makes driving easier. You say, okay, I'm going to do one lap with the TC on, one lap with the TC off. Let's see if my right foot is better than the TC. For sure, for one lap, you can do as quick as the TC. But over a race distance, allows you to concentrate on other things. It allows you to concentrate on braking. It allows you to, when you exit the corner, you can already start changing settings because you know the car won't spin. That's what technology does. You know, it makes life easier. Nobody wants Formula One to retreat from the leading edge of technology, but it's a very, very hard balance to find. Uh, and you know, there are very good minds within Formula One, and they have to concentrate on, I think now, on drawing up a set of regulations that ensure that that balance is sustained.